Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth lecture in our uh, serious competition policy and strategy, which is um, the English version of the German lecture Wettbewerbspolitik und Strategie. Um, and this is basically the translation of the lecture that I gave in 2020. Today we're going to talk about market power and basically so giving some fundamental concepts on what it actually is, what it means, um, how it is articulated in the market and uh, basically some concepts on how to measure it. Why is that important? Well, in and of itself, market power has some implications, but in terms of competition policy and practice, we basically have to uh, use these concepts as a prerequisite to uh, evaluate mergers, right? So not just mergers, but there it is a very important component that we have to take into account. But it also plays a major role in um, the evaluation of abuse of dominance and cartel cases as well. So before we jump into the topic, please make sure to like uh, the video and subscribe to our channel. Now let's get started. Um, what is, what is market power? Well, um, we can look at the guidelines of the European Commission in terms of market power and there we find a document that uh, is basically, um, that is a guideline on the application of uh, the Article 81 uh, of the treaty. Um, you have to notice that this is quite an old document, however it still applies. The thing is that Article uh, 81 is now uh, 101. So that changed a little bit. Um, however, it's the same content and the definitions still apply, right? And there, market power is, is defined as the ability to maintain prices above competitive levels for a significant period of time or to maintain output in terms of product quality, quantities, quality, variety, or innovation below competitive levels for a significant period of time. So, what does it mean? Well, first of all, um, you basically can compare, again, monopoly to perfect competition and there we have the situation that prices are higher and quantities are lower in monopoly, right? And that basically means that the monopolist has market power according to this definition. Here we also have the, uh, the, the dimension that this market power has to occur for some period of time, right? So it's not enough that um, for, you know, various reasons or by accident uh, there is a firm that can charge high prices because of production outages of, a rival, of its rivals for instance or that we have windfall profits for instance that's not a sign of market power um, so that is not uh, covered by this definition and we also have the uh, components here that we talk about quality and variety so that's a very important aspect um, especially in terms of quality and variety that we will talk about in the economics of innovation. So I highly recommend you to check out the uh, uh, Georg's lecture on the channel in terms of economics, of, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, industrial organization or economics of innovation, where it's uh, quality and variety also plays a role. Um, and the thing is that uh, in some instances we probably have not the, do not have the ability to talk about quantities, but it's rather the situation that when we have multiple firms in the market, variety is large, right? Um, because each firm produces a certain set of, uh, quant uh, of, of, of features of a given good, right? So different uh, cereals or providing transport at different points in time of the day. However, when there's market power, this might shrink. So that, for instance, we uh, have offered in competition, we have the ability to take a bus ride from A to B uh, in the morning at 6, then at 7, 8, 9, 10 and so on. Uh, and if there's market power and only one firm is in the market, we probably have a situation where we can only go at 8, 12 and 6 or something like that, right? So that would also mean that we have market power. <clears throat> it is important to note that prices above marginal costs in and of itself are not a sign of market power, right? Because we know that in some uh, businesses we have to talk about a uh, fixed cost play a huge role and 
uh, market public, uh, marginal costs do not involve fixed costs, right? So it would be misleading to state that as soon as prices are above marginal costs, we have market power, right? So that has to be evaluated against the background of the costs of the industry. We also know that market power leads to allocative inefficiency and losses in welfare, right? So that's why we usually, um, that's why we have to talk about it, right? Because we want to avoid these losses in efficiency and the reductions in welfare. Okay, so how do we measure market power? That's a very different, uh, difficult topic. And what we do here at this point is really just some, some absolutely fundamental basics, right? So. The devil is in the detail, especially when we talk about practical applications. Uh, and the, the crucial thing is that even though we, you, we could measure this uh, market power um, based on these theoretical concepts perfectly, if we apply it to reality, the, instant, the, the, the question is always what markets are relevant. And that's something we will talk about in much more detail when we talk about mergers. However, we leave it aside at that point. Um, we know from the first order condition of a monopolist uh, that we can uh, arrive at the so-called Amoroso-Robinson condition, which basically means that the learner index is equal to the reverse, um, the inverse of the uh, own price elasticity. We have um, done that in chapter A1, A2, sorry. Um, we, when we talk about market power, have to translate this into a other forms of competition. Here we do it uh, with respect to Cournot competition. And there we go to the first order condition, which we have uh, done here, right? So what we did was to maximize profits of a Cournot oligopolist. And we were arriving at a term that is basically coming from the first order condition, which states that on the left-hand side, we have the learner index. And on the right-hand side, we have the partial derivative of the uh, inverse demand function with respect to the output of one firm times the output of that firm over price, right? Um, we can uh, rearrange that a little bit to arrive at a more um, at a more at a, at a term that we can interpret better uh, and put better to potential data that we have. And in order to do that, we extend by dq over dq and q over q. And we note that the output of a uh, that the total industry output is the sin, sum of all uh, outputs of uh, of the firms in the market, and we also note that the change in total output um, in the output of a single firm is simply one. Right. So if you increase the output of a single firm by one, uh, then this will Ceteris uh, paribus lead to an increase in industry outputs of one. Right. And if we use that information we will arrive at the term that we have put here. Um, the exact calculations I leave to you as practice. Uh, and what you see here is that um, on the left-hand side, we have our learner index. And on the right-hand side, we have, again, the inverse of our own price elasticity and um, the market share of firm one based on the quantities, right? And what we learn from that is basically that the learner index, which basically we said is a measure of market power as it basically tells us how far the firm can um, go, or how, how, how large the markup on marginal costs is. Again, noting that this is not an unambiguous sign because we know that there can be fixed costs, which we have not covered here. Um, however, it's still something of a measure, right? Um, and we know that this learner index uh, is higher in equilibrium when we have low uh, elasticities, right? So when the firm, when the consumers cannot choose, uh, do not have a lot of different options to choose from, or if they need the product very, uh, very urgent, for instance. Um, and of course, it increases in a firm's market share. Right? So the higher your market share, the higher your learner index, and the lower the own price elasticities, the higher the learner index. Right? And here we just say that this learner index is a proxy for market power. Right? So not perfect, but if we have two industries, and in they, they could be the same, for instance, in terms of the cost function, and if the learner index in one industry is higher than the other, then we know that the market power 
in that industry with a higher learner index is high. Right? So, uh, with that in mind, uh, we can have some other uh, more, more we can we can talk about how to uh, calculate market uh, how how to measure market power based on more quantitative uh, stuff but more like descriptive statistics here and what we can compute is a so-called concentration rate uh, CRX we call it here which is basically the sum of the x largest firms in the market right so if we say uh, CR4 then we would count the Mark, we, we would add up the market share of the first largest of the four largest firms in the market and this would give us our concentration rate where right? we will see that below in an example the other measure that is very important is the so-called Heffendahl Hirschman index which is the sum of the squared market shares of all firms that are active in the market right so what we basically do here is we take each firm's market share um, to the power of two and add the resulting numbers up for all the firms in the market, right? What we have to keep in mind is that we can compute market shares based on outputs, but we could also do that in terms of revenues, right? So it's not really much of an issue if we use the one or the other, right? Both can, uh, can give some insights. Um, what we have to note here is that the uh, concentration rates, of course, have to uh, are in the interval from zero to 100%. Right. If we have one firm, uh, only if we have only a monopolist in the market, then uh, CR1 would be one, as well as CR2 and so on. Even though CR2 would not make any sense if we have only one firm in the market, and in a monopolist a monopoly situation, our Fendal Hirschman index is uh, 10,000, as 100 squared. And um, if we have a very very fragmented atomistic market where we have like I don't know hundreds thousands hundreds of thousands of small producers in the market then our concentration rate would approach zero uh, even if we took the largest ones right because each firm is very very small and uh, the Heffendahl Hirschman index would also tend to zero as you know each firm's market share is you know far below one percent so that would be like a very fragmented market where we have where we don't expect market Right. So, why why do we have to use these two measures? Why do we even care about that? Well, you can see the point with the Heffernal Hirschman index and the concentration rates in the given example below. Right. So here we have um, the situation that there are four, there are four firms in the market, right, and the concentration rate uh, CR four is one hundred percent in both situations, right. In the first example, we have a symmetric situation where each firm has the same market share of 25%, and the Heffernal Hirschman index is 2,500 in this example, right? Whereas if we look at the um, at the second example, we have one firm with 85% market share and three other firms with 5% market shares each, right? CR4 is also 100%, but the Heffernal Hirschman index is much higher, almost three times higher, uh, as high as the, in the first example, so 7,300. So, what does it tell us? Well, uh, both numbers taken together, we can see that the second market is much more concentrated than the first market, right? Because the Heffernal Hirschman index is much closer to its maximum than in the first example. Right? So this tells us something, even though we don't have to use this as face value, because we have to look at the market and have to understand uh, cost structures, industry dynamics, potential segmentations, and stuff like that, right? Okay, so how do we do that in practice? Well, first, if we look at the learner index, um, what we have is that when we go from a practical application, uh, we need to determine marginal costs or price elasticities, right? Uh, if we use, if we can determine marginal costs, we can compute the learner index directly. If we have price elasticities and market shares, and we need market shares in order to determine marginal costs, that's a technical aside uh, that I will get to, I think, in a merger analysis case uh, in more detail, where we talk about how to how we can conduct a SNP test. Um, in any case, we need uh, a lot of data to back out 
um, the learner index. Right? So in one case, again, marginal. if we have uh, some estimates on marginal costs, we can determine the learner index directly. If we have price elasticities, we have to use our first order condition and back out the marginal cost from there. Right? And it can be difficult uh, because we need data on that. Right? And the data requirements can be quite challenging, uh, even if you are evaluating the merger. It can be quite difficult. Right? Um, what we also have to take into account is that if we are in a situation where we have a monopoly, and uh, or if, there's, if market power is strong, we don't even have to be in a monopoly, but if market power is high um, and that has led to uh, some productive inefficiency, then we would have high market, uh, high marginal cost than we would have to have, and that would lead to an underestimation of market power because marginal costs are inflated due to inefficiencies, right? So quiet life of a monopolist, for instance, or managerial slack. We have talked about that. Um, the other thing is that we overestimate market power when fixed costs are high. That's what I've talked about, right? So it doesn't tell us much if we have a, a markup of 50% on, 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 on marginal costs, if that is roughly sufficient to cover the fixed costs in the market, right? So that doesn't tell us a lot, right? Okay, so... Um, in any case, we have some indication of the market shares and market power in, um, or we can use the market shares to give some indication of market power in an industry, um, but we have to be careful of not extrapolating anything uh, based on a single firm's market share, right? Because the picture won't be clear. But in that case, we can go for concentration rates or have an Hirschman indices. Uh, to give a more clearer picture, um, but again, it's not perfect, right? So we always have to look at the market. Um, what we also have to take into account is that why do we use that market power, or why do we have to measure it? Well, and here we come to the uh, to the point that we need needed to define a relevant market, right? Um, and that is what we talk about later on in the in the next chapter. And it also have to, we also have to, to, to take into account that we have here a static view on market shares. If you are in, a, in an industry that is um, relatively young, then we can expect to have a lot of change in market shares over time. Because the industry is relatively, it's, it's probably a new product or um, something like that. And, or we have a completely new production technology, and there we expect the market to be very, very unstable and dynamic. And in that case, it, cannot, it doesn't tell us much if the market shares in a given month are of a certain proportion, because half a year later, the market could look, could look completely different. Okay, so um, we know that um, if we have less firms, then we have higher market power. And we know that um, also prices increase if we have market power. The problem is, again, we, have, we might have fixed costs in the market. So here we have our discrepancy between, uh, between a consumer standard and a total welfare standard, because it could be, and that's what we are going to look at here, that due to the duplication of fixed costs, the total welfare is lower than the welfare that we would have if we had um, that, that would that would be ideal based on the fixed cost structure here, right? And how do we show that? Well, we start from an example where we have a demand for a homogeneous product, which looks like uh, what we have put here. So it's basically a linear demand example. However, there is a scaling factor, capital M, which basically determines how large the market is. And we have a cost function that comprises of fixed costs and variable costs. And we have we start as a, from a Conor example with M symmetric folds, right? And based on that, we can determine the, um, the, the, the equilibrium profits of a single firm here, which is basically M times A minus C over N plus 1 squared minus F. And how, to, how we, compu how we compute, compute that? Well, basically take a step back to chapter B and uh, use the um, blueprint that we have elaborated there and just incorporate the M here 
and then you can get to this example or result relatively easily. So it's just uh, a practice here. And we can we start from this point and then we assume that we have market entry, free market entry. Which does what does this mean? Well, we want to have zero profits, and this is basically a long-run perspective, as we have learned when we were talking about perfect competition. Um, if we assume that zero profit, that, that, that zero profit condition, um, then we just take our pi star, uh, pi i star, equate that with zero, rearrange with respect to n, and then we get to this uh, term that we have here, plus minus a minus c uh, times square root of m over f minus one. And that is the number of firms that we expect in a free market uh, entry setup. So if we don't restrict the market entry by any means, and if there's no entry returns and so on, so we will come to that later, um, then this would be the number of firms that enters the market. So now we take a, a little different approach and we take we compute the welfare here, uh, which we have done in this example here basically below. Again, look at chapter B, there we have computed welfare in Kuno. What you have to do in order to get to that welfare equation here, you just take um, this factor M and have, you have to take into account the fixed cost as well. And then you get to this term that we have here. And what you do is to maximize over n uh, this welfare function to get the ma welfare maximizing number of firms. And that's what we call nw. And what we basically compare is the free entry number of firms with the welfare maximizing number of firms. And that is what you see here. Um, if you use a given, uh, if, you, if you calibrate this, you use a equals 10, m equals 1, c equals 0, f equals 1, then we get to a free market entry number of firms of 9, whereas your welfare maximizing number of firms is around 3. And you have this graphically here, where you see that our welfare function um, is increasing until we reach 3, and then it's decreasing again, and uh, what we have as notable points here is that, look here, if we are at 9, this is the number of firms that we expect in, uh, in, in, a, in a free entry setup, and you see that welfare is lower. Uh, of course, you have to look at the scales here, so we are talking about a range of 93, uh, 3, 39 to 44, so it's not extremely high, but any, in any way, it's a loss in welfare of about uh, more than 10%, basically, if we compare uh, three firms in the market with nine firms in the market, right? So it's still a loss in welfare. And why is that? Well, the crucial point here is that we have fixed costs, right? And this fixed cost is basically a situation where the more firms we have active in the market, um, we duplicate this fixed cost structure. And I, we have talked about um, the term natural monopoly, where we have a situation that um, it's basically ideal to have only one firm in the market. And in reality, we have that in network industries where we basically have very, very high fixed costs in relation to marginal costs. So uh, it doesn't make sense to have two, um, two sewer systems lying next to each other. That basically is just a waste of resources. So what we would rather do in that situation uh, is to um, to regulate uh, the existing monopoly rather than to uh, to to force market entry and to duplicate inefficient cost structures. Okay, so to wrap up what we have just said about market power and fixed costs here, um, basically is that if you just look at the learn index and about and and on markups. That doesn't really tell you a lot because you have to look at fixed costs and even the complete absence of market power isn't really helpful sometimes depending on the cost structure. So competition is always good, but uh, there are caveats and situations where it's better to have less firms and uh, this is basically the case when the costs or the production technology entails high fixed costs. 
like in network industries. Okay, next we talk about contestability. That's a very important uh, concept that, from my perspective, is uh, sometimes underestimated in, in, an, in its, export, in, in its ex importance. And why, why is that? Well, the context, const, concept basically tells you that even though we have a monopolist, if this monopolist expects entry or is threatened by market entry, then this threat um, hinders the monopolist's ability to, um, to exert market power. And I think that is quite important in reality uh, in, in, in various instances. So just look at the con uh, concept. What we assume is that we have a market for, a, for an homogeneous good and we have production that entails fixed costs F. We have two identical firms and they can produce the product. However, there's a um, tremendous uh, difference between the firms. One firm is already in the market and it's a monopolist, that's called, well, that's, that's our incumbent. The other firm, the entrant, has the potential to enter the market, but it's not already in the market, right? And we have a two-stage game where the incumbent is in the market and, it's, and the, the incumbent charges its price PI. The entrant observes this price and then decides whether to enter the market or not. And in terms of the first stage, where the incumbent sets its price, we have to take basically only two situations. Uh, we, we only have to consider basically two situations. One situation is where our incumbent charges a price above our average cost, and the other case is where the incumbent charges a price equal to average cost. You won't price below it as you would realize losses, so that's irrelevant. If the entrant enters the market, we assume that the firms compete in a better off fashion, right? So we would expect very tough competition here. Okay, so how do we get an, uh, how do we solve the game? How do we know what happens in, in, in equilibrium? Well, we have to use backwards induction. So we have to look at the second stage first. If we are in a situation where the incumbent sets a price above average costs, then two things can happen. Either the entrant enters or the entrant does not enter. If the entrant enters the market, then it undercuts the incumbent by a small amount. And since we price strictly above average costs, the, entrant, the incumbent has priced uh, strictly above average costs, then the entrant can profitably undercut this one and realize profits. Or like weekly. Uh, so weekly greater than zero. Uh, however, the incumbent is now the more expensive firm in the market. Recall that we have Petron uh, in the second stage, so the incumbent realizes losses of F. If, on the other hand, the entrant does not enter the market, we have a situation where it realizes profits of zero. So what will the entrant do? Well, we basically can see it if we are in a situation where the incumbent has charged the price above average cost, the entrant will enter as he can realize positive profits. Next, assume that the incumbent chooses prices equal to average costs. Then again, we have two situations. The entrant can enter or he cannot enter. If the entrant enters, it charges a price of slightly below average costs, and that would lead to losses of the entrant. You could also stay put, in which situation the profits would be zero. In any case, the incumbent uh, would realize losses of minus F, and uh, the entrance profits would also be negative because of both have fixed costs. And alternatively, uh, so the other situation is that the entrant does not enter the market and it realizes profits of zero. Right? And so again, we can have a clear picture of what will happen. If we have price equals average costs charged by the incumbent, then the entrant will not enter the market because if he enters the market, both firms will realize profits of zero. So it doesn't make sense. Oh, zero, sorry. Negative profits as we have fixed costs. Okay. So what we have is subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Subgame perfect means that it's basically the 
uh, the equilibrium based on uh, Nash equilibrium average sub game um, is that the incumbent sets a price equals average costs and the entrant does not enter. Why is that? Well, the incumbent chooses first and if it chooses a price above average costs, it anticipates that the entrant will enter, undercut I and I will realize losses, whereas if the, entrant, uh, if the incumbent chooses price equal to average costs, it anticipates that the entrant will not enter and I will realize profits of zero. And zero is greater than minus F, so um, we have price equals average costs, even though we only have a monopolist and the entrant does not enter. So we have a monopolist that is just by the threat of entry. Um, the, so the contestability of the market, right? And that's, that's the term here. Yeah. So threat of entry means contestable market. Uh, and that eliminates the monopolist's ability to exert market power. And that's really important. Um, it doesn't always look like what we have here. What we will see next is an example where we slightly deviate um, and we have slightly more market power. However, we see that the monopolist is, is really constrained by contestability. And I think in reality, in, in many different markets, that plays a huge role. So think about, for instance, online markets. So, um, uh, search engines, advertising, uh, and so on and so forth. So social media. Can those firms really exert unlimited market power? Well, they can, of course, exert market power. That's not that's beyond doubt, I think. Um, but is it really completely unlimited? And I don't think so, because if one of those social media or search engine, what, whatever um, suppliers would basically you know, uh, uh, exert too much market power and basically abuse its, uh, its position too much, then there would be rivals coming up, right? There is, of course, the problem of network effects, which we'll talk about later, that limits the entrance ability to, to get into the, such a market. However, it's not unlimited and it's not completely prohibited that there might be rivalry. Right? But in any case, we have to keep that in mind. And in reality, it's important to consider this, I think, and it has to be put into perspective and, and it has to be evaluated against all the other effects that play a role. Okay, so here we have an incumbent. Sorry, we have the, 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 the game in extensive form here. We start with the incumbent and it can do two things either price above average costs or at average costs. If it prices above average costs, then the entrant can either enter and undercut or uh, stay out of the market. Um, and if it enters, uh, the incumbent realizes losses and the entrant positive profits. So we immediately see that the entrant will enter. And if we look at the other branch here where the, um, the, uh, the incumbent chooses price equal to average costs, if the entrant enters, uh, both realize losses, and if the entrant stays out of the market, we have zero profits. So what we and what we have is that the incumbent anticipates that as soon as he goes left here, so as soon as he prices above average costs, the entrant will enter. Incumbent realizes losses, and um, that is not that not ideal. Whereas if we have price equal average costs. Uh, that does not happen, right? And the profits are zero in that case. Okay, so now go to a, uh, to a different uh, situation where in addition to the fixed costs, the entrant and only the entrant has to bear some costs in order to enter the market. What does that mean? Well, if you are a fresh firm and you enter a market, you have to make yourself known, right? So you have to invest in marketing. You have to learn things, right? Which Probably the incumbent has already learned and the incumbent is already known, so he doesn't have to, have to invest in such things. Uh, and that leads to a situation where we have, and have, have some costs of entry as capitalists. And these costs have to be covered uh, by the entrant. And what does this mean? Well, basically, this fixed cost character, some costs increase average costs of the entrant to a level that is above those of the incumbent. So the entrant has higher average costs than the incumbent and 
the engine knows that, uh, sorry, the incumbent knows that, so the incumbent can set the price equal to the average cost of the entrant. Why? Because he knows that the entrant has to price at or above that point, so if we price uh, exactly equal to average cost, the entrant cannot undercut the incumbent without incurring losses. And the profits that we have here uh, for the incumbent are basically the difference between the average costs of the entrant and the incumbent and the quantity that is, um, that is demanded by the consumers at, uh, uh, at the price equals average cost of the entrant. That means that the incumbent realizes profits. And the thing here is that uh, in a sense we have entry deterrents because the monopolist can deter entry and still realize profits, right? Uh, whereas, I mean, entry deterrence was also a thing before, but in the, entry, in the first example where we didn't have those sunk costs of entry, this entry deterrence basically didn't harm anybody, except for competitors, for instance. But it was basically natural uh, and just a contestable market. Um, if we have higher entry costs, S, right? then this means that the market power of the uh, incumbent will increase because average costs increase and the gap between the two average costs increase. That means that the monopolist can exert, uh, sorry, the incumbent can exert more market power as he can raise prices higher. And if these entry costs are very, very high, then we have, can have a situation where the monopolist, uh, where the incumbent can really behave as an unconstrained monopolist by setting a monopoly price. Because the entrant cannot undercut the monopoly price without incurring losses when, he, when it enters the market. And that is the situation that we coin blockaded entry. And there, contestability is basically, even though in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical sense it could be there, it basically isn't there because fixed costs of entry are so high that it's basically not, not relevant. And that is also a point that we have to talk about in, 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 in real life cases or have to keep in mind, right? So it's the, the entry costs that matter here, right? So if we have a market that has very low entry costs but few firms, then, well, probably the ability of the firms is limited by contestability. Whereas if we have very, very high entry costs, this is not the point, right? And in a social media setup, it really has to. It really boils down on how easy is it for another social media platform, another search engine, another I don't know uh, streaming supplier, whatever. How easy it is uh, for such a guy to make himself known and to invest or to set up a, an attractive offer. And that really is, 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 is a point that one has to take into account, right? And sometimes it's very, very difficult, especially when we have network effects, as we will explain it. Okay, so the context that we had here was basically um, centered around the Troy example. If we talk about Cournot, that cannot happen. Why? Because um, the best response of an entrant uh, as uh, to, to if, if the entrant is to produce zero in equilibrium, the incumbent has to produce the output that occurs in perfect competition. So that's not profitable. So if we want to talk about entry deterrence, we have to have something of a first mover advantage. And that first mover advantage is related to Stackelberg competition, something that we uh, I think we don't talk about this in this uh, lecture series uh, in detail. However, it is covered in detail in our uh, I.O. class, which you can also find on economics to go. Okay, so the other thing is that we had a situation here where the entrant has to, uh, where the incumbent has to, had to threaten that it couldn't change prices afterwards. If it always can change prices, then we don't talk about entry terms because then the, the threat to deter entry uh, by changing prices after the entrant uh, enters the market uh, is sufficient to, um, to deter entry. 
right? So if the monopolist or the entrant, the incumbent can say, well, I charge monopoly price because as soon as you enter, I will undercut you and you will uh, leave the market, um, then this is sufficient for market entry, uh, for, for entry returns. And that's also a point, right? So in most situations, it also the, uh, the, the online markets that I've talk, talked about, we have a situation where it's relatively easy to change prices sometimes, right? But not always. Right. Depends on, on the market and the cost structures that we have. So something we just have to take into account in those evaluations. Okay, so the next topic is switching costs. Switching costs basically occur when the, 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 the change or the switch to another, um, to another supplier entails costs for the consumer. And that could be transaction or learning costs. So if you um, buy a new phone and you're not used to the operating system, then that, that might cost, that, then this might be costly for you. Or if you um, switch from a Windows uh, laptop to an Apple uh, uh, laptop or the other way around, you will have probably some, some learning costs to occur. The other thing is that contracts might limit you, right? So you might have some minimum, uh, some minimum time that you have to, or these contracts might be long term, or you might even um, be obliged to pay something if you uh, change the supplier, depending on what, what we're talking about here. Third thing could be uncertainty about quality. So if you know your supplier, and you know it offers solid quality, and there's other suppliers around. Probably, um, you know from something, uh, some you don't know, you haven't experienced yet, or they are from very far away, and you're just skeptical. Then this might lead to uncertainty about quality, and that might uh, lead to switching costs as well. And there might also be behavioral effects here. So something like a status quo bias. So might some consumers might whether it is this is relevant for a b2b context i doubt this but if we talk about consumers here then there might be a status quo bias which is basically uh, okay i've always been uh, at supplier a i don't see a reason to switch to a supplier b unless it's really favorable for me okay to analyze how the switching costs affect the market and how they actually work, um, we look at a simplified version of the Klemperer model, which was uh, which is based on the 1995 uh, Review of Economic Studies article, where we have n consumers and each consumer buys exactly one good in each period. So, and the willingness to pay for this homogeneous good is R. We have two symmetric firms, two symmetric firms, A and B, both have constant marginal costs, and again we have two periods, so consumers buy T equals one and T equals two. And we have switching costs F, eh, sorry, S, if a consumer switches from one firm to the other firm. So it's basically only relevant if uh, a consumer decides for firm I in period one and decides for firm J in the other period then it occurs switching costs. We have price setting firms, um, even though you can look at the model, it doesn't really matter whether we talk about quantities. Um, we have share of consumers, that's just the definition, the share of consumers uh, that buy from firm I in period one is defined sigma I, and it's defined basically uh, one minus sigma J, right? So we assume that all consumers buy, that basically means that the price is below R, which makes sense because if it was above R, nobody would sell anything. And thereby we know that all consumers N buy something and the market share is basically uh, if one firm sells its goods to 40% of the consumers, then the other firm will, buy, will sell to 60%, right? Because 100% have to be served. And we impose one assumption that is that the switching costs are positive and they exceed weekly R minus C. So the difference between the maximum willingness to pay 
and the waterfront costs. Um, that has two reasons. First, it uh, simplifies the analysis. Uh, it has one reason. <laughs> it simplifies the analysis. So the, uh, the other case is tackled in the, in the Klemperer article. Um, okay, so, um, well, the second reason is that we basically can show what we want to show uh, with this e easy example, and that's uh, elegant for uh, this uh, de deductive reasons. Okay, so just to briefly address one thing here. What we have is a so-called unit in knot function. What we were talking about before was always something like a downward sloping demand function where the consumer decides on how much uh, beer to consume and he has a, a falling demand function, right? So if the beer is, uh, has a certain price, then you just say, okay, uh, my willingness to pay for the first, second, and third beer exceeds the price. Uh, yes, exceeds the price, but for the fifth, sixth, and seventh, it's too expensive. Whereas if the price decreases, you buy more beer. But here we have a situation where you only buy one good. For example, you want to have a printer, and your willingness to pay for the printer is a certain amount of monetary units. If the printer is very cheap, you don't buy a second, third, fourth one, right? So you buy only one printer because that's enough for you. And thereby we have a situation where we have a unit amount. And here we have a situation that if the price is below your maximum willingness to pay, you buy. And if it's above that, you don't buy. So fairly simple situation, fairly simple setup. Okay. So, how do we study what happens in equilibrium if we have those switching costs? Again, we use backwards induction. So, we look at the second period first. And in the second period, we know that the share sigma i would have to pay switching costs or, you know, bear the switching costs when it switches the supplier. So, sigma i, if it switches to j, would incur switching costs f and the, ch the share sigma j would bear switching costs when it switches to firm i, right? Because again, use our example, 40% of the consumers buy from i and those 40% would have to incur s in order to buy from firm j instead in the second period. And we can show that both firms in the second period will charge the monopoly price r. Why is R the monopoly price? Well, it's the maximum willingness to pay. So we, what, we, what we want to do is that we want to extract the entire surplus. And the profits in that case are for firm I, the share sigma I times the number of firms. So 40% in our example. And if we assume that we have 100 consumers, then we would serve 40 consumers and the price would be R, our margin cost would be C, so we would serve 40 consumers with a margin of R minus C in equilibrium. Why is that? Well, if we charge a price of R, then the consumer's net utility in the second period is zero. Why? Because we extract the entire surplus. So we won't go above R, and R is the monopoly price. If we want to attract a consumer from firm J, we would have to set a price that is below R and we have to compensate for the switching costs. Because if a consumer is to switch from from I to from J, we would have to compensate him for those learning costs that he has to occur, for instance. And the question now is whether it makes sense to charge a price of R minus S, which is below R, and this only makes sense if the following conditions hold. Uh, condition holds. On the left-hand side here, we have the number of, um, of, of consumers. Why? Because if you set a price R minus S, then you attract the other firm's consumer and you, uh, you, the, the consumers that already buy from you will still buy from you. So you serve the entire market. Your margin is R minus, R minus S, so the price times marginal costs. So the left-hand side would mean you, you serve the entire market with a margin R minus S minus C. And that, of course, has to be weakly greater, at least, than the situation where you charge the monopoly price R and you serve only the consumers that have already pur purchased from you in the first period. 
right? So you don't attract the other consumers. And that is the term sigma i times n. So the 40% of the 100 consumers that would be the 40 consumers, on the left-hand side you would serve 100 consumers. You can rearrange this equation to get the point that we have here on the right, uh, and that is 1 minus sigma times r minus c should be greater than s. And now we come back to our assumption 1. The assumption 1 states that s uh, should be not smaller than r minus c. Here we have r minus c uh, times a deflation factor has to be greater than s. So assumption 1 directly rules out uh, that, this, uh, that this equation here, that this condition holds. And as this condition is equivalent to this condition, then we know that as this cannot hold, this cannot hold as well, so it cannot be optimal to charge a price that is below uh, R. Well, that's S units below R. So, just to shortly uh, wrap this up, so we were assuming uh, that it would be ideal to set a price R minus S, and that is ideal if and only if, that condition holds and we have just proven basically based only on assumption one that this condition can never be satisfied and this condition as this condition is not satisfied we have not the situation where it makes sense to attract consumers in the second period and that is because our switching costs are sufficiently high sufficiently high means that they are above r minus c and in this situation, we know that, the monopoly, uh, that each firm will choose monopoly prices P equals R in the second period. And it's important to note that the consumers will anticipate that, and both everyone will anticipate that in T equals 1. So now we look at T equals 1. And for, this, for the sake of simplicity, we, we only look at firm R. And what happens is that from the viewpoint of the first period, Firm I maximizes its present value of per period profits. Because if you look at something and you know that there's two periods, then you know that in each period you are in something, right? So the game doesn't end after the first period and also the second period is not only uh, is not the sole thing that matters to you. So uh, you maximize basically um, the sum of both periods profits, noting that you discount the second period's profits. Right? And this discount factor delta basically reflects that it's better to have the money today than tomorrow. Why is that? Well, uh, if the, uh, the interest rates are increasing, then you can basically take the money and invest and get uh, higher interest rates. Right? So the higher the interest rate, uh, the higher the incentive to, uh, to have the money today rather than tomorrow. And it's something that we have to discuss, of course, at least in... Uh, some European countries we had the problem, well, the, the, the phenomenon that uh, interest rates were very low, close to zero and sometimes negative. So this relationship might be a problem in some economic or macroeconomic environments, but uh, usually it's the situation that if you save money, if you have money today, you can give it to somebody else and that would have a return to you. And that is reflected by this discount factor. So if it's, for instance, 0.8, then the first period profits would be worth 100%, whereas uh, the second period profits would only worth 80% of the first period profits to you. Now, based on that uh, premise, we basically maximize our uh, present value of profits, V, capital P, which is a function of P1 and P2. And here we look at the first period, so we maximize over P1. And how does our uh, present value look at like? Well, it's the first period profits plus delta times the second period profits. The first period profits is only a function of P, uh, sorry, P1. And the second period profits are a function of P2 and the market share. And the market share is a function of P1. Why is that? Well, if you attract consumers in the first period, then you will have more consumers in the second period that you don't have to attract, right? Because if you have some consumers in the second period uh, you have attracted already in the first, they would incur switching costs in order to switch to the others, so you basically have an, an, ad, an advantage in serving them. That means that the market share is increasing in the price 
and we basically uh, should expect that the second period of price is increasing in the market share. And that's something that we need and uh, we will look at this now. So what do we do in order to maximize this present value? Well? well, we basically differentiate this function with respect to P1. What we have is uh, the partial, well, it's not the partial derivative, it's basically the derivative of the first period profits uh, with respect to P1. And then it's delta times the derivative, the partial derivative of the second period profits with respect to the market share times the partial derivative, again, it's not a partial derivative, but the derivative of the market share with respect to P1, right? And that's why we have that term. The, uh, the, the discount factor times the derivative of the second period profits with respect to market share times the, market share, the derivative of the market share with respect to uh, first period profits. And as we always have when we search a maximum, this one has to be equal to zero. So now how can we, what can we learn from that? Well, if we are not familiar with these terms, it might look confusing at first glance, but in, the fa in fact, it's relatively easy to get our hands on this. Well, and to, to do that, just ignore the second term, for instance, right? Assume that the, present, the derivative of the present value with respect to P1 would only be uh, the derivative of the first period profits with respect to P1. Well, that would be easy because this one would have to be equal to zero. And that would mean we set the monopoly price in the first period, right? Um, given some situations, it, it's a little bit more complex here as uh, the, we have a unit demand function and we have some sort of uh, uh, kink points here, but anyway, this is basically the intuition behind it. Okay, so with that in mind, what happens is, what happens when we take the second uh, term here into account? Well, first we look at this, this last term here. And what this basically tells us what it basically depicts is how does the market share change in the price of the first period. And we know that if you are cheaper, theta vis paribus, your market share will increase. So this term here is negative. If your prices increase, your market shares will decrease. Note that last term negative. If we look at uh, this term here, so the derivative of your first, uh, your second period profits with respect to market shares, then we know that this term is also is positive. Why is that? Well, um, if you have a higher market share in the second period, then you have more consumers uh, for which you have a competitive advantage because they incur switching costs if they want to switch. So the higher your market share in period one, the higher your profits in period two. Ceteris paribus. So this term here is positive. Delta is positive anyway, um, at least if delta is greater than zero, but uh, that's not, the, the delta equals zero is, pro is probably not so relevant in that example because that means that the second period is completely irrelevant and as long as the second period is relevant, then this term is positive, this term is positive, this term is negative. So this entire term here, plus delta times the derivatives, is negative. Right, And what this means is that compared to a situation where the second period doesn't play a role, the um, derivative of your, uh, of your oh, well, sorry, compared to a situation where you don't have a second period, you deflate something from this term and the resulting term has to be equal to zero. So what you would do if you didn't maximize if you didn't take into account the second period, would only be uh, setting the partial derivative of your first period profits with respect to price equal to zero. That means that this term would have to be zero. But here you have to subtract something, something now. Right? If the second period plays a role, you subtract something. And if you if subtract something from zero, you would be negative. So this term has to be positive in order for you to to be able to subtract something while stay, still maintaining that the resulting expression is, is equal to zero. So we me uh, that means that the first term here has to be greater than zero if the second period plays a role. So if we have switching costs, that means that the second period plays a role here in, 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 uh, in the sense that we have analyzed, 
then we are in a situation where the derivative of your first period profits with respect to P1 is positive. That means that in this equilibrium, you are in a, in a set, uh, in, a, in a range of the profit function where it's still increasing, right? Because the derivative, the slope, has to be positive. That means that you are, if you think about the profit function, it usually takes something like uh, this inverse U shape, and you are not at the at the at the uh, at the at the point where the slope disappears, but left from it, which means that the price is lower, right? And if the price is lower, then this means that you set a lower price in the first period when you care about the second period in a, in a setting with switching costs. Okay, so that's the mathematical explanation here. And the economics behind it is pretty straightforward. So what you do if there are switching costs is that you have a lower price in the first period to attract as many consumers as possible to basically exploit your market power in the second period. So switching costs don't eliminate market power. And they, they only lead to a situation where, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a younger industry basically, there is fierce competition, even if there, are, there is market power, right? But in the second period, when those firms has, have switched, then those switching costs lead to market power, right? So because there is no switching. And even in the first period, if there are switching costs in the second period, well, there can be, uh, even though there is uh, fierce competition in the first period, uh, there can still be the market can still be characterized by market power at some point. Okay, so um, if we talk about market power, then it's very important, at least in the nowadays environment, to also talk about network effects. And network effects, uh, there are two things here basically. There, there's a direct network effect and there's an indirect network effect. A direct network effect basically occurs if there are more users on your side of the network, then this benefits each consumer or user of the network on this side. The indirect network effect basically refers to the other side or other sides of the network. right? And it's easier to understand this if we use examples. Suppose you have a social media application, right? Um, if you are the only person on a social media platform, you don't have a lot of fun because you don't have anything to share, you don't have nobody to talk to, uh, so that doesn't really help. However, if there's plenty of people around you on that social media platform, then your utility increases irrespective of whether you have to pay for it, which, uh, which, which uh, device you use, whatever, right? So Cedar's power was if there's more people in the, social, in the social media network, then it's better for you to be on that network as well. So social media is characterized by strong direct network effects. If we look at auction platforms, then it's, then, then it's slightly different, right? Uh, because of an auction platform, if you are a buyer and there's one seller of uh, a homogeneous product, then it's not so good as if there would be like 100 sellers. So your utility of a buyer, Cedarus Paribus, increases in the number of sellers on that auction. And if you have more buyers, on the other hand, then it would be negative because there's other people who, have to, who want to buy the good as well, so the price will increase. And on the other end, the more sellers there are on the platform, sorry, if, if for a given seller it's better to have multiple buyers. So there's, on this auction platform, there can be strong indirect network effects. Okay, so um, if you look at gaming consoles and operating systems, then we also have strong uh, di direct and indirect network effects. So for gaming consoles, it might be good for you to have other players that can also, you can play with. And you also benefit from, uh, from, from game developers who develop games for your platform, for your console. And the same applies to operating systems. If you are the only one who uses a given operating system, then if you, have a, if you encounter a problem and you cannot search online for an answer because there's nobody else using it, then it's not really helpful for you. So there can be direct network effects. 
And there can also be strong indirect network effects because if there is applications that are developed for your operating system, then that's good for you because that helps you and uh, enriches your user experience of the operating system. We will talk about direct and indirect net network effects in much more detail in chapter I, and there we will also talk about more. We will more talk about market tipping. Market tipping is a situation where we have um, a network or two networks, for instance, and those compete. And if one network reaches a certain critical uh, mass of consumers, users, whatever, then this network will continue to grow and the other network will uh, lose importance and can, uh, will, will lose popularity. And that can, uh, that in extreme can lead to a uh, to winner-takes-it-all setup where we only have one platform due to that market tipping. As, as soon as the critical mass is reached, then uh, only one platform will, will exist. And that can lead to excess inertia and, put, and of course, persistence uh, <coughs> that can lead to the persistence of market power or excess inertia. How relevant is that in reality? Well, it depends. Uh, we have, in, in some instances, um, the coexistence of several networks over a long period of time. Right? So, for instance, think, think about the gaming consoles. There aren't many different uh, gaming console suppliers, but there are plenty. Uh, well, there are some, at least. right? Uh, and they coexist, right? Credit cards, same example. There are multiple credit card suppliers and they coexist in the market. With search engines, social media, it's probably less pronounced, but there's also some others, right? And there might be some movement in there depending on the situation. Well, good example would be social media. When uh, we look at young people, they usually don't want to be they can multi-home, of course, so can, they can be members of several social media platforms, but they want to be, they, want, don't, they usually don't want to spend most of their active time um, on the same network as their parents are in, for instance, because that, you know, feels, feels odd. Um, and that can lead to a natural switch in, in, in network, uh, in, 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 in platforms over time and also the coexistence of multiple networks. In any case, we will talk about that in more detail in Chapter I. Uh, that was all that I wanted to talk about in terms of market power. Again, we will use that concepts, uh, those concepts in terms of um, mergers in, 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 a, in a stronger, uh, in, in more detail. But from now, uh, for now, that's, that's it for me. Uh, please, uh, so first of all, thank you, of course, for your attention and uh, please like and subscribe, uh, like the video and subscribe to our channel and we see you on the next one.